So uh, for everybody who's joined in and joined one of our uh, pseudo talks series before, welcome. Thank you. Uh, this is one of the things we like to do just to kind of help people sort of come to grips with Mac management and the way things are nowadays with MDM and learn kind of some cool things that we can do in Adg to make your day to day a little bit better. So, so please excuse the uh, the cat in the background there. He's apparently figured out how to open doors now and has decided he wants to be part of our webinar. So. Again, this is our Adagy Pseudo Talks webinar series. We do these periodically for really kind of all the variety of topics, right? Uh, we've talked in the past about um, kind of Apple issues that have come up. The last one we did was actually around um, some issues with a particular Apple update beta. We also like to do these to highlight kind of new key features. You may have seen some others we've done in the past around flex policies and some other new items there as well. I am Travis Berry. I'm one of the solutions architects on the team. If you've come through, you're newer to Adagy, especially if this is your first pseudo talks, welcome. Uh, you see me on these periodically. If you've done an onboarding recently or kind of come through the trial process, it's like you've probably talked to me or Ignacio or Iggy or one of the other solutions architects on the team. So this is, this is me, this is what I look like and uh, happy to be here for everybody here. And I've got a, again, uh, lucky to have my good friend Ignacio, who actually has joined the Solutions Architect team not too long ago from our support desk. So if you've submitted any tickets over the course of the last, you know, four years or so, odds are Iggy has at least looked at it or very well been the one to respond to you directly. So thank you everybody for coming in. Uh, today we're going to talk a lot about advanced scripting items. Really, this whole this whole series or this whole webinar, I should say, not entire series, but this whole webinar today is going to be focused on ways we can leverage scripting and adagy to do things like automate tasks for ourselves, to do things like make sure that we can scale really effectively and do things, uh, do things with less, right? That's the the goal of a tool like this is to help you work at scale as you bring on more and more devices. We don't want you, you know, having to click multiple times to perform the same action. So this is going to look at ways that we can use scripting to do a lot of those. And there are a ton of ways that we can apply scripts and scripting within Adagy. We're going to show off a couple of those. We're going to talk. Um, this isn't going to be like a, an intro to scripting course, right? Uh, we're not going to be breaking down like a whole lot of like individual commands. One of the things we do have is we have some helpful links for things to help you come to grips, especially if you're brand new to scripting. Uh, but really, we want to show that you don't have to be a wizard. Using even just some very simple commands, you can apply those to really powerful effect within Adagy. So we want to show some of those things that we can do. We're also going to be showing off some pretty cool, pretty advanced scripts with a lot of kind of moving parts just to show the power of what we can do when we really start pushing things even kind of 10x on top of what Adagy offers us natively. So what's on our agenda for today? First off, obviously, we're going to start a little bit of an intro. What is scripting? How, does, how do we use it on Max? What's the context for this? Why do we care? essentially about this. Uh, we're going to talk about how we then apply scripts in our Adagy instance. A couple of the big ways we're going to look at are just scripts. We can run as one-off, right, to perform an action or even to automate tasks as part of like monitoring items or maintenance tasks that we can use. We're also going to look into leveraging scripts or leveraging custom facts within Adagy. Every, every one of these pieces is based off of scripts that we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna go into custom facts and how we can use those with monitoring alerts. We can even use those to do some really cool things with that new flex policy and the auto assignment rules around that too. Also gonna to talk a bit more about smart software and how scripting applies there, right? What are specifically, what are ways that we can leverage Adagy? Adagy can help us right out of the box generate condition scripts and installation scripts for those software packages we need to upload that aren't part of our existing public software catalog. And then the, the tail end of what we're going to do today, we're going to show off a really nifty script actually written by our own Iggy um, that goes through ways we can leverage existing Apple and MDM workflows via scripts to accomplish a file vault recovery key escrow into Adagy. You can rotate a key and then generate that within Adagy for us. So it's going to be a really big one, really handy, really excited to show that off for everybody. So a little bit of an intro. Again, what is scripting and how does it help us? Two big key takeaways to come from here. Scripts are really just kind of, think about it as kind of a stack of individual commands, right? We need to, you're familiar with LS, right? 
read the contents of a directory. We can copy files, we can move files, delete files. All of those are individual commands and they come together to form a script, right? The scripts and commands are executed in a what's called a shell. And that's the interface between the user and whatever your Unix system is, right? We're going to talk a little bit, a little bit again. We're not going to deep dive into the intricacies of shell. We are going to talk a little bit more about different types and things to be aware of with that. But the big thing, how does this actually help us? How do these little commands, these scripts, what do they do for us? Well, they allow us to do things like automate potentially really complex tasks like that file vault escrow we'll talk about later, but even just ways to identify items, right? Is a particular software installed? What version of that software is installed on the device? Right, Things where we can create these monitoring alerts to let us know, hey, you don't have a software item installed. You want to take a look at that, make sure that gets pushed out. So we're going to be looking at how we can leverage these pieces all together to create some really nice workflows for ourselves. One of the things we're going to be, and again, since this isn't a really a deep dive into how to scripts, like here are the, the top five commands, little kind of cheat sheet. One of the things we do have are some really good resources for helping you, you know, especially if you're brand new as someone who, when I started at Adagy had no scripting experience, these resources, especially that scripting OSX and then the dev hints .io, .io bash, that's like a cheat sheet basically for bash commands. So these are two really great resources for just kind of coming to grips. And then if you ever use the learn X and Y minutes, that's another great tool. This one's pretty cool because it'll actually walk you through like a really kind of multi-layered bash script and show you all the different pieces and how items are working. So these are just really good resources. Iggy's gone ahead and posted that in the chat. Everyone should be able to see those. So if you want to copy down those, you have that option right there. Let us, let us know if you haven't been able to see it. Um, part of, what what I learned to help me kind of brush up my my skills, I guess you could say with with Bash was at devhints.io. Um, you know, if if you have that that background in just like normal logical thinking or other sort of like programming language, uh, it, it translates real well. Uh, if you just think of it that way, and you're looking into it and devhints.io is real good. It, it allows you to really think about and just see and put into fruition the little, I guess, syntax differences between, you know, a programming language and Bash or or or, or ZSH as, as we'll get into it now is they're very much translatable and really get into it. And the, the more you mess with it, the more you'll learn. Um, as Travis said, this is not like a crash course on how to Bash script, but if if you need some help, um, that'll go there. Uh, and then uh, Mauro uh, Centari in the chat said, you should add chat GPT to your list of resources. That's a great resource. I've, I've heard of a lot of people that just kind of just ask it questions like, hey, I need a script to help me do this. And then it, it really feeds it back. So if you're a fan of AI, um, why not, right? Yeah, as with everything, be careful. Anytime we start talking <laughs> about the, the AI stuff, make sure, make sure you vet that. And that's actually one of the things we're gonna talk about, right, right here. Yeah. Be very careful with your scripts. These are, again, what we're going to talk about. I don't want people to have a fear of scripting, right? And that's really what a big part of this webinar is going to be about. I don't want you to fear scripting. It is an incredibly powerful tool that lets us do a lot. And ultimately, we can exercise that power responsibly and use that to make our day-to-day -day a whole lot easier. But again, these are... These are scripts that could have some adverse effects. If you're running a script with a restart command, we don't want to push that to the CEO in the middle of the you know, board of directors meeting, right? We want to make sure that we are being responsible with our scripts. We're testing these before we just start pushing them out live to all of our production devices. Um, I highly recommend uh, VMs for testing. Uh, we use, uh, I've used Parallels myself, which has been a great tool. So really handy because you can kind of go in, run a bunch of commands, try to break stuff without blowing up your entire environment. So yeah. highly recommend having some sort of either dedicated test machines, physical machines, if you've got them, or VMs can be a really nice alternative for some of that too. But as always, be very careful. To that point, um, we did have a previous uh, webinar series uh, episode about uh, virtualizing in macOS and talk, the, the talks about testing. So if you haven't seen it, or if you just want a quick refresher, you, you can find all of our uh, webinar series on the website. So you should be able to uh, get into that and refresh yourself or inform yourself. Yeah, definitely. So 
One of the new things, and this is, I say new, it's kind of been the standard for a couple of years now, but uh, for a while, Bash was the, the default shell that came with all of your Mac OS devices. Today, if things have moved to Z shell, right? That is what is standard for all new Mac OS versions. All, all of them are running Z shell. Uh, to Iggy's point earlier, in terms of what do I use when, really Z shell is the new standard. It's a lot more robust. There's a lot more options for plugins and kind of some customization that we can do. In terms of how does this affect the commands that I use, for your general use cases, obviously this is me speaking generally and mainly more towards you know folks who are coming up. We're not diving into all the, the individual intricacies. For the most part, these commands, like this example that you're seeing is of creating like a custom fact in Adage and showing the different options we have. If I flipped to Z shell, the only thing about this script that's really going to change is the shebang up at the top, right? It'll be, dot bin, it'll be bin bash instead of bin ZH. ZSH, really. But the commands itself are very similar. There's a lot of transfer over. Most of kind of the commands, especially ones that we're going to be really referencing and are probably going to be extremely useful for you throughout your own scripting with Adagy, going to be easily transferred. So don't worry too much, especially as you're kind of just coming to grips and starting to play with this about a bunch of differences between the two, right? So. This is kind of a table again that just sort of highlights some of the more some of the differences between these. Again, most of this has to do with Z shell just being the the newer item. They built it to be more robust to offer some more customization. Really, plugin support is a huge win on Z shell that you don't have with you know good old born again shell with your bash. Right. Um. What one thing I did want to point out. Um. I get this. This comes from firsthand experience. You know, it was rattling my cage a little bit when I was coming along with it is uh, if you're doing any sort of like API scripts with Bash or, or ZSH, you got to remember that um, the question mark is a, I believe is, is a wildcard expansion. So when question marks are in links, it can really throw it off. So just keep that in mind. So if you're ever working with some, some curls um, for APIs, maybe take a look into using Bash instead of Zish because it, it can it can trip you up without taking notice but you know those are those are the little things right um, mm -hmm. that we need to learn as we go right but for the most part again I don't don't expect there to be too much difference from day-to-day -day use as you're writing these scripts there's not very unlikely that you're going to encounter a lot of big kind of issues or things so one of the first things we're going to come through again most of this we're going to go through this slide deck talk about a couple of different pieces, and then we're going to spend a lot of time in Adagy showing the ways that we're using these different pieces. Custom facts, right? These are scripts that are can use to gather data from machines. The way all of the, the default Adagy device facts that you see, they're just a script that executes and then outputs that data back into the Adagy console for you. So whenever we talk about building a custom fact, you're essentially doing the same thing. And by building a custom fact within your environment in that catalog, adding it to a policy, you're basically just adding another script that the auditor calls whenever the device performs its audit. And that way it can output that specific piece of data. And this is really powerful because if we aren't, if we aren't natively collecting data, or maybe we are collecting the data, but not in a way that's easily displayable, like in the devices page, for example, you can use these custom facts to gather that data. So even if we don't have it natively, so long as that can be scripted out and we can return it as one of those four data types, either a Boolean, a string, a number, or a list, we can make sure that you have that data and then you can use it for monitoring alerts, right? If this is for a Boolean, if this is true or false, we can trigger an alert based off that. We can use these to set rules for our auto assignments. All of our auto assignment rules are based off of device facts, whether that be custom or uh, default adage facts that we have. Also, don't forget about the community tab natively in the portal. You have the ability for uh, jumping in and being able to copy facts that have been created both by us at Adagy, obviously, but also any one part that's using Adagy can submit a fact that they create to our review team. The review team goes through, we make sure that the scripts do what they say they do. Obviously, there's nothing malicious, right? And once everything passes all of our own testing, we add it into that community tab as well. So hopefully after kind of after this webinar, we'll see a lot more scripts and facts within that community section as well, get a whole wave of submissions, keep us busy. 
Now, when we talk about kind of running scripts, and we're going to try to maintain that kind of difference. Remember, a custom fact is a script meant to gather data. And we're going to kind of refer to custom facts and scripts a little bit separately, although functionally they're the same thing, right? So a script is meant to kind of take action on a device, right? I want to delete an application off of a machine. Maybe I want to promote a user to admin. These are items that can be accomplished via a script. And that promote user to admin, there's actually already a good script within the community section as well for that. These scripts can act as your remediation instructions for monitoring alerts. So with Adagy monitoring, what you do is you set up an alert. You say, keep an eye on this device fact. If this fact reports back this specific value or exceeds this allowed threshold, I want you to raise the alert for me, right? And then once that alert is triggered, we can also apply a script onto that item to act as remediation. So when the alert fires, Adagy automatically triggers that script to try and solve that problem for us. Right? Scripts can also be made available to users in self-service. So you can actually give empower the users a little bit, again, within reason, right? Might not want to just have a constant promote user to admin script constantly available for a user in self-service. That might be a little bit of a problem, especially if you're trying to keep them from having that permission all the time. But you can add scripts to your self-service portal that users can though go and calm down. You can pair that with the, the ability for them to generate tickets. Hey, I'm having this issue. You can say, well, actually, I've already built a script. Go check in the script section within self-service, and you can launch that and be able to do that themselves. So the, and again, that community section available for scripts also. Good. Now, again, the big things with our, our custom facts talk about with the, the data types here, right? Yeah. We have, yeah, go ahead. Eddie. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna jump in here to stop out. Yeah, so custom facts come in four different data types. Um, we have strings, Boolean, uh, lists, and number. Um, some of the data types don't really aren't listed as you know normal you know data structures or data types people are used to you know strings are strings um you know so the way how you will see them um in the devices page when you're filtering out things is going to be you know does the string contain does the string equal or does the string not equal in the monitoring page you'll get you know things like contain does not contain greater than greater than um or equal to you know, those type of operators. And then also uh, another place to keep note of is going to be um, now with auto assignment and flex policies in your policy filters, they are different filters for different device facts as well. Um, dependent on the, as we said, the data type of the device fact is how we're going to be looking, right? Um, for strings, it's going to expect a string in your, in your, in your uh, script output. So, you know, something like a, making sure that the command outputs strings into standard output or you know you force that into a variable and then echo it out um, with lists it's expecting arrays um, that way you know you can check if the ar array contains certain value of the arrays ever changed um, in booleans it's true and false um, you're not going to be exiting out anything very um, special it's just expecting for you to echo out true or false that way adagy will parse that out and then give you a nice green or gray bubble in the device fact on the device page and then number um is expecting um digit only and i believe uh single single dot like decimals um so we need to remember that these are like you can't use number for multiple element versions so it, it won't it won't get anything that's past like a decimal with, you know, 3.14 will be, you know, 14151, however <laughs> far down you can remember a pi. But um, if you add into the mix another dot, like 3.1.2, um, numbers will not pick that up. That will be need to save as a string. And then you can make your comparisons by either keep, you, you chop up the string or you use another form to compare the values. So let's look at some examples here. And again, we're going to show a little bit of the examples and then really kind of dive into Adagy and show how to use these. This is an example of a string. Again, remember what I'm, this is going to do is it's going to look in the applications directory specifically for Slack. Is the Slack app installed? If it's not installed, it's just going to echo out not installed, which is a string. 
And if it is installed, it's going to give me the version number. Now, again, the version number could be like a 13.4.2, right? So there'd be multiple, multiple decimals, so to speak, in that number, which is why your version numbers you don't want to treat as just a static number for if they have that extra point in there, then the, it, we really want to treat that as a string so we can report that data accurately. Right, so something to keep in mind kind of trips can trip people up from time to time. Don't make that mistake, use the string return type. Right. This is another example of just a Boolean fact, right? All this is, this is just, uh, this is an even simpler script that dash E is, does this file path exist, right? So does, in this case, we're looking at Google Drive as opposed to Slack here. Does Google Drive exist? Is this app installed? Echo true, echo false. You could use this example really for any file type. We're using it as application identifier here, but you could use this for a specific installation file, a specific driver file, potentially even if you were looking at printer deployments, right? You wanted to make sure you were only deploying to a device that had the proper driver installed. If you know where that driver location is going to be or really anything, point that in as part of a script like this, very simple Boolean, yes or no, does this exist? Awesome. Now, change this into a little bit, we're gonna look, talk about smart software here, right? And smart software, this is when we're talking about, again, we have a software item that we need to deploy. A lot of times you'll see this potentially with an antivirus, right? Or need to deploy that of your own, really anything. If it's not part of our public software library where it's pre-built and the installation scripts are already provided for you, right? All of that is ready to go. We provide the package, we provide the instructions, we provide the checks to make sure it installs successfully. All of that's ready to go. Whereas with smart software, none of that is built completely out of the box. However, Adagy has ways to make that process a lot simpler. We can actually generate a little easy install script for you. If you've got a PKG or a .sh file, there's a little button that you'll be able to show off here in a little bit with smart software when you upload the file. It'll just say add installation script. And if it's either one of these two file types, it'll generate a script like these two here, right? So basically it's just the instructions. Oop, let me back that up. Just the instructions for pushing this out. This is the, install, the installer for a PKG file and then obviously the file path. As a general hint, unless you make some change in your installation script, the default install location for all custom software is going to be a library Adagy Ansible packages, and then whatever the name and version number of the software item that you've given Adagy there, and obviously the file name for the actual installer. Other one, again, bin bash, that is for executing a .sh file. So if you have some sort of .sh alongside, we see this sometimes with a file where it needs to run some sort of process. If you can copy that, upload it as a .sh alongside your installer file, both of these will be able to generate for you nice and easy. Now, if you've got a .zip file, or if you upload a .at.zip, one of the things to keep in mind is that Adagy actually will compress that and it'll make it into a .app.zip file if you upload just a .app. So what you want to do in that case, again, unzip dash O, very simple. And again, the reason we're putting double quotes on the file path is so that we don't have to use any kind of fancy work to escape the white space. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Basically, double quotes make it so it's going to look for exactly what you have within that. So just make sure that the file path is correct. And then we're going to be unzipping that into the desired location. A lot of times, if you've got a .app file that you're pushing, it's the unzip dash O. Again, library adagy, Ansible packages, you know, Google Chrome, dot app, that whole file path. And then the secondary part would be unzipping. It would just be kind of slash applications because we're going to unzip that file into the applications directory, right? And that's typically what a lot of your, your dot app files are going to need. They're going to want to be opened and placed there. Now, DMG file or disk image file is one that you're going to see a lot. They're very, very common. We actually have a really good knowledge base article that this script kind of comes from here as an example. Again, just support.adagy.com. And if you search DMG, you'll see it as like the top result. Um, but basically what has to happen is we have to use this mount command, right? We have to mount the volume, right? Whenever you open up a DMG file, it'll mount a new volume on your Mac. And so what we need is the, the name again, same thing, library Adagy Ansible packages. This is the installer file you're pushing from Adagy. And then this is the actual name of the volume that's being pushed, right? Being opened up on the device. And we want to know what are the contents of that in the volume. So one of the easiest ways that I find whenever you're working with a DMG is actually open that locally on a Mac, 
right? Again, having a test device is valuable for this. Download the file locally, open it up so you can get the proper file path. You can see what are the contents of the DMG. In some cases, you might get lucky. There are some installers that'll come as a DMG file. But if you look at the contents, the only thing that's inside is like a .txt file, which is like some product information. But the installer itself is just a PKG. You can actually pull that out and upload it to Adagy as just a PKG and have us generate that easy one-line install for you. Again, that's not a one-stop shop solution, but something that we see fairly often with, the, uh, with some uh, DMG files that you have. But in essence, we need to mount the volume. Again, HDI util mount. And then at the very end, what do we do? We need to unmount the volume that we've just pushed there. Right? And that also makes it so if you go back open Finder later on the machine, you don't see this extra volume here. Condition scripts are a really important piece of your custom software items, your smart software pieces. Now, again, when you look at public software, we build these condition scripts automatically. Again, with added with smart software, these aren't built automatically, but we have these options where you can just fill these in and we'll create a check for you. We'll add it to the condition script field for it and make it nice and easy as, as much as we can, right? This may not be all that's necessary. And we'll talk about kind of some other checks we can make with custom software. Uh, for example, just looking to see if a particular file path exists may not be enough to identify whether or not something was actually successfully installed. Could it be maybe there's a permission issue that wasn't granted. We, there's some additional checks that we need, but we have ways again that we can we can help you make some simple condition scripts and get started because you really don't want to create smart software without a condition script. The reason for that is Adigy deploys the policy settings every 30 minutes. So when you create your software item, you add it to a policy. If you hit deploy now, we'll roll it out immediately like with everything else in that policy. But after that, after that first attempt, if there's no condition script, the Adigy agent doesn't have any check to make sure that it's only installing when necessary, right? So what happens then is that installation actually just gets skipped. So when those automated runs, the condition script isn't there to try and identify, yes, we need to be reinstalling. Hey, do you have this? What version are you running, right? If it's running an outdated version, then we can apply a condition script like you can see there on the bottom to check that. And if it's an older version, great, install this item. It's gonna update that and keep us moving. Otherwise there's no check. So you're losing out on that automatic enforcement that the policy settings allow you to have. So yeah. again, one of the things talking about the some advanced checks for smart software, a big thing that you're going to run into, and I said permissions magic phrase earlier, right? There are a ton of macOS permissions that your users are going to see, right? Whenever you're trying to install software, that's installing it locally or installing through, you know, Adagy, really using any tool. The way that we bypass the majority of those prompts, the things like the full disk access, the accessibility, right? Those big ones, the system extension prompt that your users will see, especially most every antivirus nowadays needs both a system extension whitelisting profile, and it needs a web content filter profile. And now the addition of uh, the service management payload as well as in, in, uh, in Mac OS Ventura, the big one. Exactly. So what we can do is we can actually use this command here in order to find and look at all of the profiles that are installed. And we can use that to grab the identifiers for those profiles and use this to make a check in our smart software to say, hey, does the whitelisting profile exist on the device? Because if the whitelisting profile exists, then when I push this, the user shouldn't receive the prompt, again, for accessibility. You may vary. Some software only needs one or two pieces. A lot of times, you're, the most common ones are going to be like accessibility and then full disk access, probably, uh, for most of your kind of standard applications. Again, anything really security focused, like an antivirus, um, those are going to require things like system extension whitelisting profiles. And each of those have their own unique identifiers. And again, we can use this command on a Mac and we'll run this and show you exactly what it reports to grab the appropriate identifiers so that we can build a check into our custom software. And we can make sure that the software is only installing after these profiles are present. That way we're making that install as silent as possible and easy for both us and the end user. Yeah. And then um, uh, as well as, as that, you know, this can be, that conditional check can be expanded as well into checking for multiple IDs. So if you're expecting multiple profiles, 
uh, you can tinker with that if condition script and then really and add a couple more if you really need you know to check for multiple of them and that way you're making sure hey this software needs like three of them right i need full disk access i need accessibility and i need you know service management make sure i have all of these before i'm before you even try to install because if not it's going to be a prompting nightmare you know that's how we think about these things as admins and if we go about thinking of it that way and then applying that to scripts for problem solving we can find ourselves creating solutions that are just beyond everything else that you know we, we would think was a lot more intangible or problematic in the past Exactly. And you're going to see even like we're talking about this in context of a condition script, but you could also use this as a custom fact as well. So you could use that as an identifier. You could use right. it for your monitoring alerts also. So when we talk about, again, really the nice part is since all of this is scripting at a baseline, it's just all scripting. There's a lot of different ways we can put these pieces together and use them. And that's what we're going to kind of show off here in a minute. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about and we're going to show off and we actually kind of may we may start the show with this when we jump into adagy here is the the ability to leverage scripting to perform kind of a lot of complex actions at once so the scenario we're looking at here is um, we're bringing in new mac os devices into our adagy environment these devices have file vault active because we're being good admins and we made sure that they were file vaulted before, or if we kind of brought on a new client or just some new devices, we got lucky and they were already file vaulted. That's great because the disks are encrypted and we don't want to potentially decrypt those machines and expose that vulnerability. So how can we generate a new key, right? Whenever you enroll a device into Adagy, really the the main way that you're going to be getting your keys into Adagy is by creating an MDM profile to enable file vault, pushing that to the machine and allowing that to kick off the encryption process and then finalize it and escrow the key into Adagy. But the problem is, is if we enroll a device into Adagy, we push the file vault profile, that key, MDM can only grab that key by default if it is the mechanism that was used to enable it. So if file vault was enabled locally or you know they were previously encrypted through another MDM, we're not going to automatically see that key in Adagy. So the way that we can work with that and the workflow that we'll show that Iggy's kind of built out for us in the script is using this command, whoop, jumping a little far ahead, using this command here. So sudo FTE setup change recovery key personal. This script has a couple of, or this command, right? Just single command we're looking at. This command has a couple of prerequisites. For one, in order for this script to work, we have to have the device enrolled into Adagy MDM, right? Not another MDM. And we have to have an Adagy MDM payload for, for an, and I say payload profile, I mean one in the same, an MDM configuration profile, the security and privacy option that will enable File Vault on the device. That profile has to be installed on the Mac. And then the last thing we need is end user interaction. This is actually going to, it, it relies on prompting the user to enter in their password in order to generate a new recovery key and then kick off that escrow into Adagy for us, right? So we're actually going to jump in and we're going to show how this works here. So give me just a minute to pull up our handy dandy Adagy instance. So we have our device here. And in this case, let's say we've got a Mac and it's already here, right? It's already encrypted. Another thing that we want to show is there's the option also just for hitting the this rotate key command within MDM, right? This is another MDM-based command that'll generate rotate, get us a fresh new key. This doesn't require actually leveraging the, the script that we're going to talk about here. So this is another options that here, but as always, what do we do when this isn't an option for us, right? Let's say maybe for example, that this device just is having problems communicating with MDM. You know, let's say that this machine is just having problems executing this particular command, right? Just doesn't want to seem to run this command on the machine. Well, we can leverage our script and it's actually available in the community now, right here is actually the, the newest one added. So prompt to rotate the file vault key. Right. And so when I talk about copying items from the community section, this is what I mean within Adagy. You can see there's this whole library of scripts. Again, a lot of these are generated by us or other Adagy users. And we make sure, obviously, that you get your credit, whoever you are that submits it here. 
So once your fact, your script has been vetted, we add it into the list and you can copy that straight over into your environment. I've actually already gone ahead and done that in here. So what I can do is I can come in, if I wanna see all of the scripts or maybe I wanna start building a brand new one, I can actually go directly into the devices page again, the main devices page here, not go live, something to, to keep in mind there. So all devices and then the manage tab is where I can see all the scripts either that I've created myself or copied over from the community section here, right? So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna search file vault. Nope. What did I name it? Or did I just forget to, to copy it over entirely? Let's just go back and copy it here. We'll search prompt this yeah. time. As he's as go. he's copying that over, um, while he's running the script, and as we see it live, as he's going to connect to the device as well, um, one thing that you're going to notice is that there's prompts that are requesting different information from the device. Um, those are some utilities that are being used from the native uh, Apple Script tool, the Apple Script uh, CLI tool. Um, in order to collect data. Um, if you want to take a look at the script like he's showing right now, it, it, it is in the community. It's it's a cool nifty tool to have in your belt when you need to run things that require some user input. Um, there's some there's some other points in there as well, like a password validation, um, you know, multiple password attempts and um, different different like other checks as well in there. So if there's even deeper um, just thoughts and um, points that you'd like to learn, I really recommend taking a look at the script. It, it covers a, a couple of bases on, on different things. And um, yeah, so Travis. Yeah, and again, the, the thing, the, the big takeaway that I want everybody to have here is this is us you know, really kind of pushing things a lot, right? There's there's a lot more complex workflows here. This is obviously an example of, you know, a script that took a bit of time. There's a kind of some interconnected parts. We're prompting a user. We're doing a bunch of different things here. But don't feel like all of your scripts need to work this way, right? It's perfectly fine to just have a script that tells you if an app is installed, right? We don't need to completely reinvent the wheel with every script. We don't need it to be this incredibly complex, you know, multi-layered workflow all of the time. But this is to show like, again, really, truly, this is the, this is kind of an example of what is possible for us, how far we can push things and we can get really complex if we need to. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to go back to my devices page. I'm going to grab that script. I'm going to search prompt this time because I remember what it was called. Select my machine. And I'm going to push this command to the device. Now, again, I have the option, I can add this to the self-service portal. And what that'll do is it'll populate it in the self-service icon. If you've got a configuration deployed, remember that bit, make sure you have a self-service configuration deployed. And then this gives you the option to put commands in front of the user. Again, empowering the user, giving them the ability to call some scripts on their own should they need. And then when I push that script from Adigy, what you can do is directly go into the history key. Now you'll see that this is blue. That means that this is waiting for some action. So if I go and I look back on the device, enter in the password here, it's gonna then say, okay, great, cool. We've actually gone through and we have done the file vault key rotation. And we're gonna be pushing this new key into Adigy, you can look at it and go live security, right? So. Like we saw, this is a script that has kind of like a lot of moving parts, but in terms of like the end user interaction, it's very, very simple. We're just asking for their, their password there so that we can do this. And then if we go back into that security tab within Mac, or within the GoLive page for the Mac, I should say, what you'll see here is again, this is the, the old key that we had before, right? So what has to happen is the device actually has to go through and perform an MDM audit. Because remember, we call this via a script, but what actually escrows that key is MDM. So one of the things that you can do is you can come in and you can security information should be the only one that you need to kind of 
you know, force an audit for if you want this to be a little quicker. But you can always come in and just update all of these individual items. And the device will run through. It's going to perform its check. You can always follow things along within the events tab as well, right? Anytime you're sending commands or working on these machines, you can always go back through and you can see these items. So right here, we can see that we've queued these MDM audits. Just a minute or so, these should execute. And once that's all done, we're going to see our fresh key. So we'll check back on this in just a minute, and it should pop up really quick. In fact, I'll just hit refresh list for giggles. So hold on to this for the back of the, in the back of your mind for just a second. In the meantime, what we want to talk about next are things like custom facts, right? We talked about this before, right? So one of the ones that we're going to do, again, I just want to kind of use this to illustrate, like, we don't have to be super complex and doing a bunch of different things. But I want to show you just how powerful a fact like this is in and of itself, right? So what this will do is this fact is actually going to spit out and give me the, oh, and this is actually an older version. Let me update this real quick because I was able to clean this up a little bit and make it a little better. So this in and of itself, add in my pipe. See, look, get a little bit of a, a live demo here for everybody too. And what this is gonna do, the reason I'm making this change, and actually, you know what, let's do, let's do this. I'm gonna run, I'm just gonna run the script as is for everybody. So you can see this. This is a good example of kind of just some, some live work we're doing here. So let's say I'm building out a, a custom fact, right? And I want to make sure that this actually works. What I can do is I can go in and I can just create this as a script if I wanted to, right? So I'm going to call this script check select version, right? And with this, we're going to call this the applications category that I've got in here. And for description, reports the version number four Slack, right? And I'm just going to drop this script right in here. We'll just hit Create. And now I'm just going to hit Use, run this command again back on my machine. Nope, wrong one. Just send. We'll run that script out. And then in history, I can go in and it's going to give me this, not install, right? So this tells me Slack isn't installed. So what can I do with this? If Slack is not installed, to kind of illustrate, show the power of all these kind of interconnected things. One thing I can do is I could come in and I could generate a monitoring alert, right? That says Slack. And again, Slack is just the, the app that we're using here as an example. This could be really anything, right? Any particular file path or whatever application, just in the application directory is super easy. Um, I'll wager that probably everybody deals with um, probably like three to four pieces of software a day, where if you don't have any one of those, you can't do your job, right? Or your customers can't do their job. Somebody in the department can't do what they need to in their day to day. So one of the things that we can do is come in and actually, it looks like this list hasn't updated with my or with my fact. So what I'll do instead, because I just realized Slack version. So if the if this equals not installed, right, the output of that fact, I want to generate an alert for this, right? And I can pair this in, make another category for applications. I can enable remediation on this. So I could have a script that executes. If I wanted potentially that even curls down the installer file for Slack and executes that on the device. In this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave remediation off for a second and I'm just gonna generate this monitoring alert. The other thing that I can do is leveraging flex policies. I can create a brand new policy here. I'm gonna call this install Slack, right? And with flex policies, if this is the first time that anybody's seen it, what it allows you to do is it allows you to go in and it allows you to choose any of the facts, again, either default attitude device facts or custom facts that you've created. And it allows you to create assignment criteria for an entire policy, 
right? So as opposed to just pushing one item, now that's what this policy is gonna do. It's just gonna be a policy to deploy Slack for us. You could actually create a policy that deploys a whole bunch of things, right? So this actually works very well when we kind of, if you saw our little uh, compliance pseudo talks that we did, this actually works very well for that because you can build a policy to deploy a whole host of MDM profiles to enable things like File Vault or Gatekeeper and handle some of that security compliance as well. But in this case, we're going to focus mainly on the custom facts. So what we're going to do here is we're going to set this up. So if we find any of these, if this fact on any of the devices that has this fact installed on it reports back that it is not installed, this policy is going to find those machines and apply itself to those. So currently there are no devices matching this filter and you're probably wondering, well, why is that? That's because always remember, you do have to apply the custom fact to the policy. That's how it gets delivered to the device, right? So in this case, I'm gonna save it. I'm gonna come into the policy where my device is currently, which is this AAA pseudo talks. I'm gonna go into the custom fact setting up here at the top and I'm gonna add this to the policy and we're gonna do an immediate deployment to push that out. The other thing we're gonna go do is we're gonna go have a look back at our Mac. We're gonna check this security tab and make sure it's not making a liar of me. So there we go, about six minutes ago, so not long after we ran that command here, just a couple minutes, perform that audit, we now have that new key by running that script. And again, the that script available in the community section, I highly, highly recommend that script especially if you are bringing in new devices into your Adagy environment, I highly recommend it. Again, it's just the first one in the scripts currently, but the one you wanna look for prompt to rotate file vault key. It works, it works very well, uh, especially if you know the, the file vault was enabled locally or an external source. What will happen mm -hmm. is that when you have that MDM profile um, to escrow the key from, from Adagy, it's going to force that new key to escrow up uh, because we're making a new key and encrypting the disk with uh, Adagy's file vault uh, certificate, right? There's certificates that go along with those, with those encryptions. Um, another cool thing to think about when we're talking about uh, auto assignment and flex is if you go back to um, the auto assignment for me, Travis. Oh, yeah, no problem. Um, if we go to filter, there's another cool checkbox that we can take a look at um, there where it says unassigned devices that no longer match this filter set. This is a very strong tool, especially if you're automating processes with flex policies, um, especially with this use case that we're talking about right now, right? Slack version. So does Slack exist on the device? You know, no. So then if Slack does not exist, it's gonna come into this policy Odds are, what are you going to do? You're going to install Slack in this policy, right? But once Slack is installed, do we really need this device in this policy anymore? Probably not. So with this tick box, what it's going to say is when it no longer matches that filter set, get it out of the policy. I don't, I don't need it, you know, another deployment check on my device anymore because I know it's not necessary. That check is, that check is happening with my fact. So you can rest assured that, you know, if you have multiple kind of like, patchwork workflows that are helping you out, you know, make sure some software there, Flex Policy is real strong in that sense to help you make sure that those devices come in, get what they need and get out. It's really fast and it's very, and, and, and it's very useful. It almost works like a, like a nice assembly line type thing. If you really think about it, it's a nice big cycled workflow. The thing to be careful about with that, to, to ease point though, is if you are uh, enforcing MDM profiles, if a device loses a policy, so let's say it's in a policy where it says you're supposed to have all these MDM profiles and then we remove it. If it doesn't belong to another policy that also has those profiles, it's gonna remove those off the machines. With software, most public software, you don't have to worry about that as much uh, because the only thing we need to check is, is there a removal script? If there's no removal script for software and most of these Adagy created public software items do not have them, that means Adagy doesn't run any sort of cleanup. So in this case with install Slack, it's gonna jump in this policy, Slack is gonna push, and then it's gonna update the fact on that machine to say, hey, Slack is installed. You don't need to be part of this policy anymore. And it's gonna remove that policy from the list. 
Right. So it makes it really easy to do that kind of remediation. But again, as with anything, something to, to be careful with, especially with the, the MDM profiles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, so yeah. another actually good question we talk a little bit about here, because we're actually uh, about to move into more kind of just open Q&A. So feel free to start throwing some of those into the questions field if you haven't already. But a good one came out whenever we're talking about the and Iggy, I'm sure you've got a, a you've got a, a story or two on this. Um, with that file vault key escrow and the institutional keys, right? So if you're encrypting with an institutional key, does this will this work the same? And are there any other potential kind of gotchas and things to work to to look out for with this? Um, I would say if, if you're encrypting with the institutional key, if you take out the configuration that's forcing the institutional key to be the encrypted way to do it, then to rotate it that way might work. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have a clear answer for that. I haven't tested that exact scenario. It's a, it's a great question. One worth testing, you know, one, one very, one worth testing, um, and what yeah, we can I, do is we can uh, we can try to do a little test and get back to you. That's a that's actually a really good point. I think with the institutional key, I don't know if the MDM rotate command will work on an institutional key. So that's something we'll definitely follow yeah. up. That's a really good question. So very good. But again, the big thing to to keep in mind with your whenever we're talking about doing our scripting and things, we're doing these. We're building out these workflows. Again, my advice is always start small. Start with something like that. And then there are ways to, to optimize this. So going back to kind of what I wanted to look at before with this Mac is if I want to look at the facts in this list here. So this tells me right now, fact value not installed. And that's because Slack wasn't installed on this device until just now. Now you can see that auto assignment has already grabbed this. And it's going to push, it's already assigned this policy to the device. So whenever the policy does its next automated deployment, or again, as always, if I just go and hit deploy now, it's gonna then include that instruction to roll out Slack. Let me just double check and make sure I actually did add it. I'm not making a liar of myself here. So perfect, yeah. So this is gonna push out. We can even check the deployment status here. And so with this, it's going to run that instruction and it's going to install this. And then that will update probably here in just a minute on that. And then after that happens, the, the, uh, the device fact data itself will update. Now, another really important piece to device facts, and one of the reasons why I harp on them so much, is you also have the option in your devices page, you can create these custom table views. So you can actually cycle through these based off of whatever device fact information you want to display for that view. And this is also really handy because you can export this at any point in time. So not only can we use monitoring alerts with our, these facts, we can script remediation to be a part of those alerts, right? Not only can we do all of that, but we can also use these custom facts for our reporting in the devices page natively. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a brand new table view. And in this table view, the only thing I really care about is the Slack version. So in this case, I'll leave the online status, device name is good. I don't really care too much for the policy ID. And I wanna go back and look at Slack version. And then just delete that. And let's drag this. I want this to be, oops, deleted it. I forget you have to hit the, the big handy reorder button on the right side of the screen if you want to move those around. So I can change these around if I want this to be like Slack version. I basically want the, the device name and then what version of Slack are you running, right? So I can save this. And then now I have this table view and I can jump back and forth. You can, uh, to my knowledge, no one's found the magic number that breaks these device table views yet. So make sure that, uh, make sure that uh, you kind of create as many of these as you need. Right, you can use these for to augment all of the existing reporting and things that you're doing here as well. So. Yeah. And as we're going in there, uh, I wanted to go over another another um, topic because it is one that I see that um, is probably not one of the most used um, custom fact 
operators, and that is going to be the uh, list. The lists are real great. If if you like working with arrays or or if you're forced to work with arrays, um, lists are, are are really great. They're really powerful. Um, but we just really know how to work with them. We need to know how to work with them. So Travis, if you go into custom facts, I went ahead and created one. I deployed it out, but we can let it um, populate. So if you take a look at that, um, I wanted to go through this um, because it it is it is a, a very very important aspect of scripting, especially if if you're going to be working with multiple elements that get returned. Um, lists are very important. Um, this one's very basic. We're just going to be collecting the items from inside of a directory, storing them in an array, and then printing them as a list. Um, so breaking this down real quick, um, I want, I'm not a really huge expert on what the IFS is. I believe it means infield separator. Think of it as, you know, the delimiter between what you want the next, the next element in the list to be delimited by. Here, I'm sending that delimitation to every new line, right? So that I'm creating um, the variable for our files array. And then I'm saying, you know, for every element inside of library added G Ansible packages, which where we all know is where the packages get downloaded, all the files get downloaded from smart software and stored on the machine to act on these installations, um, you know, add it to my array. And at the end, I'm gonna print my full array list, right? Um, that last line in line 11, um, is a syntax on how to echo out and print an array list. Um, and that will show, and Adagy is able to parse that out and, and hold it correctly. Um, so Travis is going to run this locally real quick to show everybody what it looks like. Uh, another array list that gets added in Adagy and that you can take a look at is the, the installed profiles fact is a list. So when you're taking a look at it from Adagy in the devices page, what's going to show is a number. It's going to show you how many items are in that list. And when you click the number, it's going to give you all the contents that are inside that, that list. So we'll go ahead and we'll run this and we'll get a nice output. It might look a little bit convoluted and bunched together. That's just how arrays print at the moment. <laughs> It's or only in, one, right? <laughs> so yeah, we only or in have this Slack. Case, just this one. Yeah. Um, at the moment, we really only have Slack. But if you go into, um, if you go back to the devices page, Travis, I should it should have already have populated. I sent it out a, a little bit ago. If you look in columns, look up profiles, um, installed profiles, and then also the look up the uh, the library adagy and so packages fact so packages. That's not how you spell yeah. that. And just list here. There you go. Yep. Yep. So if you so, take a look, uh, it's not done populating yet, but if you see there is the number, the number of elements inside of the list. And then when you click it, you'll get the full list array. Um, yeah. So and now, if, if you wanted it viewable directly on the page, you could always just store it as a string. It's just... Uh, when you're doing different types of checks against lists, when it comes to, you know, flex policies, when it comes to monitoring and it comes to other and, you know, device filtering, you won't get the extensive, you know, help of what lists can do differently than strings. If you only care about what it looks like on the devices page, you can change it that way. Yeah. And one of the kind of making sure that we, we get through some of these other questions here. One of the ones that came up is, do we have any plans for adding platform variables? And the I'll share the, the example that was given in the question because it's one that we, we hear a lot. When I want to deploy like my antivirus, my Sophos, my CrowdStrike, you know, whatever we're dealing with, I have to build essentially kind of like a, an individual software item to handle those different license keys for each of the different kind of customers, different environments that I'm supporting, right? So I can tell you, we do have plans for implementing uh, variables and global variables that we can, you know, set within your Adagy environment and then be able to call as part of your different scripts, right? Including for things like custom software and also just scripts that you write and create. Uh, we do have plans for it. It is something that's being looked at. There's no official timeline that I can share now. 
um, because if I try to speak at a turn, the product will show up at my house and it'll be a big problem for me. But yes, we do we do understand the frustration, in it, especially with with antivirus in particular, that this would solve. And we're uh, we're looking at ways that we can get that done. So um, another question that got asked, another very good question was with Adagy scripts, do they keep old versions of those scripts? So if I were to update you know, a script that I have in my environment, if I were to come in and here, what happens is we don't store like a, a repository of all the different versions. It's just whatever you're editing and saving, that is the only version of the script that we're going to save in the environment. You could create you know, a brand new separate entry if you wanted to maintain kind of a version history, but that would be how you have to do it because we don't keep that repository yeah. of the scripts there. Uh, the only scripts, I guess, if you could put that in between air quotes that keeps the versioning will be smart software. You can always create new mm -hmm. versions of smart software and, and they will, they'll script themselves out. Um, the cool part about that is that if you head over to the policies page, Travis, on the left-hand side, if you do create new versions, uh, you'll see that big yellow button on the top right, glow yellow, and that will glow yellow if, you know, we publish something new in the public software catalog, part of, you know, the new version, if something in the public catalog that you have assigned in self-service is newer, or if in your own mm -hmm. smart software, you create a newer version of it um, by using the new version function, uh, it is not the same as, you know, just renaming it the same and applying a, a higher version number. Travis, if, if you could walk us through that real quick, because I know not yeah. a lot of people know that. So if you go so, over to, go ahead. Yeah, it, in this case, it actually looks like we might have like a, a little bit of a bug here live, Iggy. It looks like it's telling me that, oh no, I'm just, I'm just reading it backwards. I've been reading yep. too much manga lately, I guess. <laughs> reading right to left instead of left to right. So what it's telling me is, hey, you're using this older version of this public software item. There is a new version within the public software catalog so what we can do is we can press this button. It's going to show me, okay, where are where am I currently applying that software, right? I want to go ahead and I want to say, yep, let's do this. Select the policies to update. We're going to say select all. So right now I have an old version. And actually one of these other policies that's kind of nested a child policy that we didn't really even use in this, this webinar series here, right? It's part of the example. But what this does is lets me say, oh, okay, actually I didn't even realize this is a perfect example. I didn't even realize I'd let that get out of date. Let's go ahead, let's update that version. And just like that, it's now going to apply the latest version of the software in yeah. there. So again, another kind of handy way that that yeah. can be handled as well. Yeah. We got another question uh, from Jonathan. When writing an install script for a custom software, how would I use a script to A, uh, check if unmanaged, B, if unmanaged, uninstall with the script, uh, uninstall with a script, which mm -hmm. must quit the app and then install the new one. And then lastly, have the same script easily be modified to check for the version of the software it's installed. Um, that is a great question. There's a lot of points there. Um, so to check if a software is managed is kind of tough uh, because there's a lot of there's a lot of differences in different configurations in different softwares that can't really tell you if it's managed or not. Uh, what you, I guess, what you can do. When, when we're talking about managed software, there, there's multiple things, right? Is um, if the software is available from the app store, uh, there is a script, I believe, um, that you can check if it's installed from the app store um, or also if it's installed using apps and books. Um, and then, you know, you can detect from there and then install it that way. But if it's from custom software, it's kind of tough. Um, if it's a, if it's a licensed software, I'm sure there's a way if you can check if the device already has a license on it, looking into different configuration files. So that might be somewhere you can take a look into and run your condition checks in there. And then if not, you know, delete the app. Uh, we'll probably be, you know, looking to delete it. And then once you delete the app, it'll it'll quit it. And then from there, the the install would run from there. Um, it's kind of tough to to see. If you're having issues like that at the moment, um, you can actually go ahead and submit a ticket to supportadagy.com. They're pretty great at you know just talking through it and and getting and speaking with you and seeing if there's something that that you can um, that you can work with 
that's currently on the device. It's hard to tell like this, but um, we can for sure help you out on that front. Yeah, and that's also just kind of a, a good kind of general point as we sort of start to bring things to a close here. The the other big point of this is you're you're not alone in this, right? We we can help you, right? Uh, for one, I'd highly recommend if you're not already get into the the Adigy Slack channel in the Mac admin Slack. Um, there's there's a ton of people who've actually come in and kind of commented and provided some some helpful answers on some of the questions folks have asked already. Um, who are just Adigy? I mean, five star Adigy admins really. They're pushing. They are pushing the products a lot. You'll also find some of us who kind of work in there to answer questions and things like that. You can always submit a support ticket. And in fact, I highly recommend it if you're building out a custom software, you're building out a script, and you're maybe getting error messages that don't quite make sense. Or, you know, of course, the inevitable, you know, hey, it works on this machine, but not another. Can I get another set of eyes, another test on it, right? Support can definitely help you kind of troubleshoot and do things. They support can't really help you build things all the way from the ground up. You can't just tell them, hey, do this for me. And they, you know, expect that they'll build it up. That being said, we do offer like a professional services as well, where if we want to go that route, we can sit down with the scope of work and kind of come up with what it would take, you know, what's feasible, how long we think it would take, come up with a plan to get you a know, cost for helping basically just build something, put it in your environment, show you how it works and turn you loose on it. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have multiple avenues, yeah. but never hesitate to reach out to the support team. Again, just support at adigy.com. Uh, shoot in, create a ticket, say, you know, hey, I've got this script. I get this error. It doesn't quite output in the way that I like it, or adigy just doesn't want to run the script and I can't figure out why, right? especially if you're getting something weird like that. Don't ever hesitate to reach out. That's just a general rule of thumb with adigy. Don't ever hesitate to reach out. Um, even if it's maybe not something like a, you want to talk a little more theory crafting. Um, we can set up a call even to just kind of talk about that and be, if nothing else, just kind of somebody for you to bounce ideas off of and help come up with an idea for what a good kind of custom factor script would be in your own environment. So don't feel, again, the, the big point with this webinar, if you take nothing else away, is don't let scripting be scary, right? There are a lot of good resources out there. Again, make sure you copy some of those that Iggy put in the chat for everyone. Because um, those are, especially if you're new, that dev that dev cheat sheet is invaluable for me. Uh, scripting OSX is great. They actually, you can subscribe for like daily updates, basically, on kind of cool new things, things you can do with scripting. Don't let this be scary. You don't need to be a wizard. You don't need to be an expert overnight. Just start somewhere, right? Start with a simple custom fact. Is a software item installed? Boolean, true, false, right? Start there, start small. And I can guarantee as you start to look at these, you'll find other ways that you can leverage scripts and, you know, find, source the community, the literal community tab here in Adigy, that Mac admin Slack channel. Um, there's a ton of just GitHub repositories of, you know, just stellar citizens who are out there putting out knowledge for anybody to go and find. Yeah. So, so there's get um, out there and have fun, basically. Yeah. So we have one more question in the chat before uh, we wrap it up. Uh, Marshall, uh, can a custom fact be created to call the last MDM response time? Um, that is a great question because I, I I'm not 100 sure, but it's a great it's a it's a great exploration tool. So I know that in the community, and um, I believe Device Facts, I published something a little bit ago about um, a connectivity check. Mm -hmm. um that it, it works in a very that connectivity check fact works in a very um niche space where it's checking for a certain error output in the in the logs of the device while looking for processes spawned by mdm client and if it doesn't detect any errors um then it then it'll, it'll show you know the connection is okay um could be a little misleading because it could just be the connection is bad and then when you know connections are being attempted so no errors are being printed. So mm -hmm. if you are going to use this, I know it's, it's, a, it's a separate point, but if you are going to use this, try enforcing different MDM connections before you check the fact and give it a time, a bit of time, like enable or disable remote, remote, uh, remote uh, desktop, I believe is the, yeah, is the one. Or again, any of or, these, all of these are MDM based yeah. audits, essentially. Yeah. So you could have that, you could have that fact be installed and then perform any of these audits yeah. to trigger an MDM check. Yeah. So then if you go back to that community script 
And this is where Travis's point was coming from. It's like crowds, crowdsourcing ideas, right? If we take a look at that uh, custom fact, and if you see um, in the MDM connectivity check, there is a log show uh, predicate, and then you check for the process coming from the MDM client. Um, you could always check um, and read through those those that log and really take a look to see if there's anything that indicates whether the MDM last response time is is valid or not. Uh, the way that we print it in the UI is from the actual MDM connection server. So it's not coming directly from the device. But if you wanted to pull a custom fact, you know, via script, that's where I would start, right? Um, I don't, I, I can't tell you what it is that you have to look for, but that's where I would start. Yeah. And the, yeah. that's a, that's another thing too, is the, with MDM connectivity, that comes up a lot because so much of what we're doing is driven by MDM. That's another thing where I would say, um, especially if you suspect you're having problems with MDM connectivity on one device or even a whole host of devices, just go ahead and submit a ticket. We can pull some logs from our side. We can kind of have a look at some of those things too. Again, like I said, you're not alone in this. We are here to support you and help you make sure things are getting done. And for something like MDM connectivity, we wanna make sure we have all the info we can get so if you you find you're not getting what you need, need a little more help, submit a support ticket. We can have a look. Yeah. And then uh, one last, uh, two last questions. Is that rotate file vault key script being published? Yes, it is active in the community already. It's this prompt to rotate file vault key. We already so, got seven copies. There we go. Yeah. So feel free, grab that, give that a test in your own environment. Um, another question, again, in case you, you missed it before, as of right now, we do not have a way to define global variables for your scripts, uh, to set those in like specific poly so you can call that, again, to, to reference that license key example, again, right, there's not a way yet to set a global variable and then be able to write to that in your scripts. It is something that is actively kind of being looked at. Again, there's no official timetable on it, but it is something uh, something the product and dev teams are very aware of and we've yeah. they've been talked a lot about. Um, since we're on the topic of advanced scripting and you know we're here, um, there is other methods that we've seen different um, partners of Adigy use. They've used uh, case, case or switch statements in their bash scripts. Um, and I would maybe take a look at that. I believe in the in the dev IO hints link, that we have there, there is some some documentation on how to use uh, case case statements, um, and those should help you, you know, out. Um, you can do things like you know if this device has um, you know this. Uh, you can probably take a look into it. Um, you can find. I believe that we have a a command somewhere. And if not, uh, submit a ticket about it. We can send it to you and ask them about the the command that pulls the the policy name, because um, we usually have a, a we we have a command that does that. And if anything, say that that you know Iggy sent you, and then in the ticket we'll we'll get you that command over, and then you can map a policy name to a certain um, token, and then that case switch will check you know if in this policy use this token if in this policy use this token if in this policy use this token um it kind of combats that antivirus you know needing certain keys for certain for certain installers for different clients um but you know that's what we got at the moment until we get those global variables figured out i know project uh the product team is currently exploring it and they're they're trying to figure out the best avenue forward um and we want to make it as usable as possible from the jump. So that's why, you know, we're not just saying, you know, global variables and it's out like that the next day. So. Exactly. And then the one last thing we'll leave off here, because I know we're a little bit over time. So we appreciate everybody hanging with us here. A lot of good questions coming in. Um, if you have issues with the script, if you're getting where it's failing with an error code of one or any kind of, you know, any errors, one of the things to double check first and foremost is one, Kind of the always remember it has to be enrolled in Adigy MDM. You can't have just the Adigy agent, and it does have to be Adigy MDM. It has to have a security and privacy payload, right? An MDM profile installed, like this one that I've got here, that is enabling File Vault, right? It has to have this option, right? 
make sure that this is true, that this profile is in fact installed on the device, right? And assuming the device is communicating with MDM and it satisfies those conditions, then that command should work out for you. And if it doesn't, uh, if you're still getting errors, even though the device satisfies all these different conditions here, right? Uh, definitely let us know because that means we need to uh, we need to have a look at that fact. So let us know if you still get those errors, but that's exactly what you want to check. And for everybody who's, um, we actually have a knowledge base article that goes over um, exactly kind of using this. This is sort of what this is, uh, what this is built off of, right? It came from Iggy and I kind of uh, looking at ways we could make this process a little easier. So it is part of this knowledge base article, which I'll pull up on the screen here, right? Importing file vault keys into Adagy. So, and I believe this was actually referenced. One of the ways that you can do this is you can actually upload like a CSV file and run a script that reads the matches the serial number in the CSV file that you've got to the devices that you've got enrolled and it will import the key that way. Mm -hmm. The script that Iggy and I built, this is what it's leveraging. Obviously there's a bunch of extra pieces tacked on, but remember we do have these requirements for that device. It has to be an Adagy MDM, has to have that file vault profile with file vault enabled on the device. And then it should prompt the user for the password right when you run that script. So things to keep in mind, again, if you, you run into that issue where it's just not executing, you keep getting errors, feel free to submit a support ticket with the give us that serial number for that device and uh, the team can have a look. Yeah, I'm going to put in the chat real quick that command actually um, about, about um, pulling the policy name. Um, it also, I believe it also pulls its, its parents as well. So it's going to pull the full tree. And then the last one will be its policy name. So if they are nested, you're going to see the full kind of like tree path. Um, that's going to be in the chat. If you get any errors, it may be due to the, the quotes uh, being converted to um, soft quotes when sending it through Zoom. So please go ahead, you know, drop it into some sort of like um, some like ASCII text linter. If anything, make sure it's using the right soft quotes not the the hard quotes and um be sure that you know it's useful apply that into a variable in your scripts and have some fun you know yeah and lastly as we kind of close things out here again i want to thank everybody for for going up and hanging with us for almost an hour and a half here um a couple of things honestly adagy.com slash events that is where you can register for pseudo talks we're doing these monthly right um the we are also uh, posting all of our pseudo talks. So after we do this, you should, if you've registered for the webinar, you should get an email uh, that links out so you can get the recording and you can view this later too. Uh, but it should also be available at adagy.com slash events as well, right? And then obviously the little sales bit, if this is the first time you've ever seen Adagy and you're blown away, how could you not be with Iggy and I here? Uh, feel free, you know, come on in, we can set you up with the demo, figure out if we're the right tool for you. Uh, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and close everything out. Thank you, everybody, again. Hope this was really useful for you. And uh, come back next month. We'll have a brand new, super cool topic. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us. Um, I personally love talking about scripting and stuff like that. So it's been a pleasure. I'm glad everybody's here listening to us. Thank you again.